worship you and be bless your holy name. Come on, give our worship. Thank you. 
office book, on Zoom, on YouTube, on conference call. Those who will join us later, we praise you that we can worship you in the sanctuary. I pray that you heal those who are sick among us, uh, two who are suffering or three who have suffered from COVID on the past week. We ask you to grant your healing to each one of them. In the name of Jesus, thank you for healing Dr. Roberta Choi and sending her home from the hospital. We praise you that you are still healing. You're the great healer. Sometimes we uh, neglect to praise you like we should because we focus on those who perhaps did not get a healing and went on to glory. But today we are in the sanctuary and realize that you have healed us and spared our lives and brought us to worship because you have done that, O oh God. And so much more, we praise you today for another chance to worship together in, in your sanctuary or by the radio or by the screens that they're watching or by the calling. You are able, despite what we see and what we experience, despite the ambiguity that goes along with life, Despite the things that we cannot change, despite the things, oh God, that we struggle with week after week, we reaffirm our faith right now in the God of our salvation. We declare one to the other, you are able to do exceedingly and abundantly
between two cities, the city of Sardis, which the Lord pronounced in this same chapter, was a church that had a name and a reputation, but was dead. And it was also located between Laodicea, which was in this chapter, that had uh, a lukewarmness about them. They couldn't decide whether to be all out for the Lord or to be for the Lord sometime and be forsaken or something else the other time. And the Lord said to Laodicea, I'm going to spew you or spit you out of my mouth. But unlike any of the other six churches in the book of Revelation, this church, Philadelphia, God, uh, spoke a word of commendation and praise to them and said to them, I have sat before you an open door. That is tremendous. He said to them, you have been faithful. Everybody shout faithful. You have been faithful even though you were between a dead church and a lukewarm church and in the midst of idolatry and in the midst of all the philosophical jargon and ideas that were going on, you have been faithful. No, 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 uh, after that, where a church is located or what is surrounded, surrounded them does not determine faithfulness. Faithfulness is not determined by where you are located or what you are faced with. Faithfulness is determined by the condition of your heart. Somebody say, it's my heart. Church of Philadelphia had two major challenges or obstacles that he mentions here. He said they have a little strength and they have been put out or excluded from the synagogue so they didn't have the prominent place of worship. And yet they were faithful. No, number two, faithfulness is not dependent on good circumstances or a lack of opposition. Faithfulness has to depend on your heart and your faith in the Almighty God. In the midst of that opposition and in the midst of everything that Philadelphia was facing, uh, they remained faithful. The Bible says they had some trials that they were experiencing before and prophesied to them that you're going to have trials again, but you have remained faithful. Thus Jesus said this inspiring message through their pastor or through the angel and said to them the door is open or there is opportunity right now. When a door is open, you know you can walk in or walk out. And he said there is a door open for you that no one can shut. I open doors that no one can shut. I close or shut doors that no one can open. But he says to Philadelphia, I have sat before you an open door. Apostle Paul said in three passages, twice in the Corinthians and one in Colossae, he said to them, the Lord has opened an effectual wide door for me. And in all three cases, what Apostle Paul was referring to was that God was giving him opportunity to do ministry for the kingdom of our God and our Christ. I don't think that we can sometimes consider this passage, Reverend Goldsmith, to be the opportunity to do ministry in the kingdom of our God and our Christ where we are already situated. But if you look at the text, they had opportunity in the face of adversity and opposition. And Jesus was dependent upon his church. That's pretty much the history of Mount Zion. In the face of much adversity that I'm going to talk about a little later, God has provided you an open door, the opportunity to do ministry regardless of what was around you, regardless of what you saw or faced, and 
and regardless of what you suffer. Opportunity to do ministry divinely comes, and we must never see opportunity to do ministry as a problem. Tom Peters once said, if a window of opportunity is open, don't pull the shade out on it. Sometimes when God provides opportunity, we're looking so hard at the problem that we miss the opportunity. Somebody help me preach this sermon. H. Jackson Brown said it this way, nothing is more expensive than missing an opportunity that you have. Uh, I'm turning to the person you came with to say, God has provided us opportunity. In the midst of whatever you see, God has provided us opportunity. Somebody shout opportunity. The door is open. Always open for the faithful to do ministry. Look very quickly at the three dynamics in today's text. It's open for us to serve this present age. When Jesus told the church at Philadelphia that the door was open, they had existing problems. They knew those who pretended to be Jews, but were not, and thus they had been excommunicated or excluded from the synagogue. They were in the most idolatrous place they could be in because they had big idols all around them. And yet God said to them, I have opened the door for you to do ministry. Sometimes people are talking to me as if we live in such a bad time and the generation is so bad and the people are so bad. And everything that we have is so bad. Have you not heard or read the Bible that what we're facing is nothing but opportunity? Uh, are you not reading our own history that what we're facing now may be a little different from what we're facing then, but this is nothing but opportunity. The door is open. It was open in 
we, we thought that we had to have certain people in certain places, but the truth of the matter is, we just need favor from God. That will get it done. Somebody shall favor. God was filled with Satan to Philadelphia. You have my favor to go forth and do ministry. The opportunity is now. The time is now. Time when young people are partying in the streets with guns and a whole half gallon of liquor and smoking all kinds of things that are all to them. It's on video if you haven't seen it. A time when uh, COVID-19 has curtailed attendance in worship and stifled many activities. A time when some politicians value their party over human lives, liberty, and democracy. Come on. A time when sexuality and marriage has been redefined by the government and the courts rather than the Bible. A time when hate crimes are becoming more prevalent and more frequent in America. A time when schools are suffering mass violence and death as if they're in a war zone. A time when there is vandalization of the houses of God and the sacred places. But listen, God says, I open a door. Is it any different from what Philadelphia was facing when they had opposition over here, but they were excluded from the holy place of the city God, but there are idols erected in their midst? Is that any difference? I don't see any. Difference has to be how people respond who believe in ministry. Jesus said, I've set before you an open door. There are new opportunities to do ministry. Do you see them? Winston Churchill said that a pessimist sees the difficulty in every opportunity, but an optimist sees the opportunity in every difficulty. The door is open. So that when we see difficulty and a problem, is that all we see? Somebody, somebody just shout out, look again. Look at the problem again and let's see what the opportunity is for us to do ministry since the Lord said the door is open. It's open to serve this present. Age. Is that any different from not being able to ride the bus in 55? Or being raped almost whenever they were ready? Is that any difference from police officers beating up people and telling them to get off the street because of their race or ethnicity? Or that nationality is there any difference? And yet we are saying times have changed. Times have changed. People have changed. You had the same ugliness then that you have now. You might have more now because there are more people in the world today now than there were then. And you've got more media publicizing it even when it's happening. But times have always been challenged. There's always been opposition for the church. There will always be opposition for the church. But I heard Jesus say, the gates of hell shall not prevail against the church because he opens a door for us to do ministry and he'll protect his church. Let me go to the second thing, the second dynamic. Um, the second dynamic to serve the present age. The door is open always to save the lost. The world is always lost in the Bible. I said the world is always lost in the Bible. When the Gospel of John talks about the world, he's really talking about unbelievers most of the time and the darkness. The world is lost. 
and there are still deceiving Jacob that have not become Israel. There are still evil Nebuchadnezzars in the world today. There are still uh, unclean goers and very bad leaders. There are still demonic men like Legion. There are still white collar groups like Zacchaeus. There are still people like Simon the Sorcerer. There are still uh, the self righteous Pharisees who are always condemning others but never looking at themselves. There are still people like the woman at the well who've been broken over and over again and just needed another drink from the fountain of life. Still Matthew, Peter, Andrew, James, and John, and others. The only thing that says is the world is still filled with people who need to be saved. With people who are lost. Jesus said that the door uh, is open to save the lost. Now some of you are going to say, well, I grew up in the church and I've never been outside of the church. That didn't mean you were saved. Mm -hmm. I grew up in the church just as lost as I could be. And I'm not the only one. I grew up in the church. I went to Sunday school every single week. But I don't love Jesus. I have not committed my heart to him until something happened. Don't miss it because the world needs to be saved. The world is still lost. And so we've got to help people to understand what the great hymn that is a fountain filled with blood means. We've got to tell them how to say about the amazing grace that saved a wretch like me. We've got to say to them what we grew up saying. Yes, Jesus loves me, for the Bible tells me so. I'm not always right. I haven't done everything good. I have been bad sometimes. But yes, Jesus loves me. For the Bible tells me so. It actually says in Romans 5, when we were still sinners, he loved us. Before you decided to give your heart to Jesus, he was already loving you. Before you said yes to the preacher and walked down the aisle and shook his hand and said, I believe in Jesus and I want to join the church, the Lord had already loved you. Apostle John says in the epistle of John, we love him when he first loved us. The world is still in need of being saved. And so let's offer salvation. Let's be sure our housemates are saved. Let's be sure our roommates are saved. Let's be sure our classmates are saved. Let's be sure our playmates are saved. Come on. Let's be sure that people we know and we come in contact with are saved. One of the most exciting uh, times uh, to lead somebody to Christ I had was flying back from San Diego from the mid-winter meeting. And that was uh, 16 and a half years ago. I only remember it because Kay Alexandra was getting ready to be born the next month. It was in December of, of uh, 05. And on the way back, I was seated next to a young Caucasian male. And, and I didn't do well with my seat selection because I hate uh, to be in a new seat. It's kind of hard to just be in your seat when you're 6'4", 250 pounds. That's, that's a bad seat to be in. But when I was in a new seat and on the aisle was this young Caucasian teenager. And I started talking to him. Because I couldn't go to sleep this time. And his name was Matthew. And I told him, and I asked him if he knew what his name meant. That was my segue into the conversation. You got to have a way to get in, you know what I mean? And once he told me his name was Matthew, uh, I had just been talking about Matthew with a great friend before. Uh, I 
left for San Diego. And so I started a conversation about his name. The short of the story was, in 10 minutes, I was leading Matthew to Christ. And his family was seated across the aisle, his mom, his dad, and other young folks I had. Uh, you know, I'm used to go take my Bible, one Bible on the plane. And so I gave him one of my personal Bibles and said, Matthew, just as I've led you to Christ today, you want your dad and your mom and your other sisters and brothers to go to heaven. So I want you to tell them what I've just done for you, and you do the same thing for them. It was a good fight. It's the best fight I've ever had. Because Matthew said, I want to be saved. The world is still out there. There's still people that you're going to come in contact with that need to be saved. Sometimes they're strangers, but sometimes they're in your own family. The best moment in our Christian ministry was one revival night back in Wetumpka, Alabama, Dr. Thompson. I was preaching revival, and at the end when I made the invitation to be saved, my old Trauma. 
best to not be ugly because you can't have ugliness with ugliness. And you can't change meanness with meanness. But if you can just do what Jesus commanded, if you can love those who hate you, and if you can bless those who curse you, and if you can pray for those who despitefully use you, you are sharing God's love to them. We know about this. Even in the secular world, when Keith Thompson and I were really dancing, we knew a little about Very little. One of them said, what the world needs now is love. Love, sweet love. Another one said, all we need is love. It is an answer. There are so many people hurting. What they really need is love. The will needs love. The sick needs love. The will of the haves, the have nots, both of them need love. The kind and the mean, both of them need love. The good and the bad, both of them need love. The great and the small, both need love. One of our greatest challenges is to do precisely what Jesus said. Be ye therefore perfect. And I have to correct the student not all ago. I said we better go back and read the context of what Jesus was saying in Matthew when he said, Be ye therefore perfect.
want you to examine your own thought processes today. Examine your own heart. As people are shying away, I don't know if I can serve. I think it's too bad of a time. That's not the history. The history of Mount Zion says God always opens the doors and the people respond.
district shares in a 30-bit baby contest today in this sanctuary. At 5 o'clock, the West Montgomery District will be downstairs to honor Reverend Jesse James Fountain, who has a birthday and who is retiring. Reverend Fountain has been killed the last three months. He's on a sabbatical, a paid sabbatical. Reverend Robert Felder, our member, has been filling in for him. He has come to the place of retirement after about 62 years. Isn't that something? I was born 62 years ago and he was preaching. What a mighty work. Those who are worshiping with us, would you stand? I want to have one visitor's card. And that's my best friend for life, Dr. Keith Thompson. Stand up. I almost said forever, Dr. Keith Thompson, that won't work. <laughs> Integration wasn't all bad. He became one of my best friends in high school and middle school. And then on to high school, and we have never lost each other since the integration. His oldest daughter was baptized in the old Mount Zion on a Saturday, and the children's choir sang under the leadership of Mrs. Janice Banks. No, it wasn't advertised. But there were about 50 of us in there that day. Thank you for being in worship today. God bless you as you go today. Thank you, Brother C.P., that's right. Give him a big hand. He didn't have to come to worship. I didn't invite him this time. He volunteered and just said, I'm coming over to the church. So thank you for being present today. That's, from my perspective, the leading oncologist in Montgomery, Alabama. And I won't say anything else. God bless you as you go. Have a great week. Remember to pray. The ushers are at the North Ex door. Please remember to give your tithes and offerings. They are certainly needed. Grace, mercy, and peace be multiplied unto you from God, who is our Father. From Christ Jesus, who is our Savior. And from the Holy Spirit, who is our helper, both now and always. And the people said amen. 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 And you may share with Big Zion, that's your member, Reverend Shondland Elliott's church anniversary, is today at 1.30. It will be on Facebook, and your pastor will be preaching by God's grace.